Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Zaki. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. My name is Alan Zaki. On this week's episode, we have international beauty brand ambassador, Robbie LaRiviere. Yes! Hello, Robbie. How are you? Hey, Alan. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you so much for joining this week's podcast. I'm so happy to be here, Alan. I've been loving the Creative Lotus podcast just every single week. You're such a brilliant interviewer, and it really is just my absolute honor to be here. You're too kind. I appreciate that. So, Robbie, can you kind of give us some of some background on kind of where you're born and raised? I know you're on the East Coast right now, but maybe for our listeners? Yeah, no, of course. I, I'm born and raised in Massachusetts, a little town called Haverhill, Massachusetts, which is about I would say 40 minutes north of Boston. It's kind of on the northeast corner there. And my family has been in Havel for something like 10 generations or something like that. My wow. my great-grandfather purchased it from the Native Americans. That's how far we go back. Like So my family's been here a long time. But I do currently reside in Los Angeles, California with my boyfriend, Gavin. And I've lived in L.A. for 12 years. Wow. So what took you, you are going straight into my next question. What took you to LA specifically? You know, I, I was always curious about LA, but when I was, I received my hairdressing license at 17 years old. Hmm. And after getting license, I moved to Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is a really beautiful, uh, kind of gay artist community on the very tip of Cape Cod. I worked at the West End Salon uh, but being a seasonal town, you traveled during the off season. So I actually went and I moved down to Brazil and wow. was living in Brazil. I was living in Brazil, doing hair down in Brazil. This is all at 18 years old, mind you. And when I came back to America, my mom thought it would be a good idea to brush up on my beauty skills. So she sent me to Vidal Sassoon Academy, which is in Santa Monica, California. And that was my first time in L.A., completely fell in love with it. And 12 years later, here I am still living in Los Angeles. So it was definitely love at first sight when I moved to LA. Wow, that's fantastic. I did not know about the Brazil. What specifically took you down there? Was it just like desire to get out and explore or? Yeah, I think a little bit of that. I am the Sagittarius. So we're Sagas are citizens of the world. We love to, you know, constantly be moving and going, uh, living different places. But living in Brazil came from my boss. His name's Dougie Freeman, and he owned the West End Salon. He had a secretary named Marcio, who was always talking about this little town called Buzios, which was two hours north of Rio. And it's almost like the Hamptons of Rio. It's the playground for the rich and beautiful in Brazil. There's 25 white sand beaches, all with it, its own different feel. And he wanted to open a salon there during the off season. So he sent me down there to check out the scene and see if it would be viable to open a salon there. Of course, unfortunately, it wasn't, but it was a beautiful time, and mm. it was definitely one of those life-changing uh, times of my life, for sure. Amazing. Did you learn any Portuguese, or did you know any Portuguese going down there? Ala Portuguese, tá bom, tá bom. That I didn't speak a lick of Portuguese when I get there, but if you're thrown immersed in a culture, it's kind of like survival. You need to learn how to, you know, say a few phrases to get you by. So I was able to pick up Portuguese. That's amazing. I love it. So yeah. I'm interested in knowing, you know, obviously you went to a very famous school, Vidal Sassoon, which is incredible. And yes. then you, you've stayed in LA since then and working kind of all over the the beauty brand, um, you know, field. Yeah. So kind of what was the spark that really got you into like beauty and working in this industry? You know, it's for me, beauty, it seemed like the right path for me to go. I come from a family. Everyone has a degree in something. Everyone went to, you know, the four year college, went, got a master's. I was the first in my family not to go to college. You know, that was a really mm -hmm. big deal. And that I went to beauty school instead. And for me, I just felt like I was ready to grow up and start working. I was sick of academic life. Granted, I was top of my class, all private schools, but I was just Alan, I was over it. It was as if someone flipped a switch and I needed to get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. And I think it also had to do with coming out of the closet, being a young gay man, and just feeling comfortable in the beauty salon environment. My first job was actually as a receptionist at a hair salon in the town I grew up in. And I I saw these hairdressers laughing and having fun, and the clients were laughing. They were, the owner of the salon 
was named Jose Battistein. Hmm. And he had a line out the door of people waiting to get their hair done with him. And these guys were just making hand over fist. And I said, this is a business, an industry I could see myself in, and being very comfortable as a, you know, rather effeminate, flamboyant, young gay man. It just, it felt like I fit right in there. So I, I loved the beauty salon scene uh, since day one. That's amazing. Yeah. I feel like in the beauty salon, you kind of, it's like all the secrets come out as well. I don't know what it is about being there, but you can tell your hairstylist all the tea and all the shade. And it's just kind of like stays there. You know, I love that you said that because I either growing up, I wanted to be a plastic surgeon or a therapist. <laughs> and I doing hair was the best combination of the two. I can't handle blood. The sight of blood, I'll be passed out on the ground, throwing up in a cold sweat. And, you know, th therapy, I can't listen to people's problems all day. So at least when they come into the salon and they have problems, we're able to do their hair and make them look beautiful. So they start to feel beautiful as well. So I feel like therapy sessions, you don't really get that from the therapist. You right. kind of leave kind of thinking about what's going on in your life, but without the fabulous hairdo. So yeah. I, I love beautifying people. I love making people feel beautiful. So it's That's fantastic. It's stuck. Yeah. It's almost like you're, it's almost like those client privilege uh, secrets that you have. It's kind of like the bigger the hair, all the secrets get stuffed in it. You just kind of keep them all. Yes. And everyone has a secret and I've heard it. And like the most conservative Connie that you've ever seen in your life has the deepest, kinkiest skeletons in her closet. It is wild. I mean, especially doing hair for three summers in Provincetown. We saw it all down there. Whoa, wow. whoa. Yes, I love it. P-Town for life. She's she's yeah. ready to go. Um, yeah. So I was interested in kind of, you've obviously lived here in LA and it's a very competitive industry. So how have you been able to kind of keep going through all of the, the ups and downs, let's say, or the personal struggles that you may have had? Um, and have they really helped you to propel your career and stay in the, like for the longevity of it, if you will? Oh, absolutely, Alan. You know, LA is a, a hard town because it's a bubble and you can get very consumed in it. And my biggest advice for people that perhaps aren't from Los Angeles are to get, get the heck out of there. You know, you got to leave and go back to wherever you need to go and then come back and you can really appreciate LA even more and make it what you want it to be instead of getting in the whole struggle of Los Angeles and keeping up with the Joneses and trying to get the next gig, that whole gig to gig environment that I was working when I left the hair salon became very stressful. Uh, where my next paycheck was coming from was like my waking thoughts in the morning. And it wasn't until I was able to leave LA, get my head back on my shoulders and then come back to LA that I really feel like I've been able to sustain throughout the long run. And keep in mind, you're talking to me after two weeks here on the East Coast. So I'm a big proponent of leaving Los Angeles and getting out of your head. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how that's when the phone calls start to happen. That's when the emails start to come and that's when the gigs start to happen. So by removing yourself from the situation, I feel like that's when things really start to work. Absolutely. So you kind of mentioned that you had to leave for a while and then come back. Can you kind of go into more depth, if you will, about kind of what took you away and then kind of what maybe brought you back? Yeah, of course. You know, I was in Los Angeles working as a Beverly Hills hairstylist. Things were really going well for me. I was on a reality show and I was on The Gay Bachelor. It was all just, you know, it was a great time in L.A. for me. And then my father uh, got sick. He does suffer from alcoholism and he got into a little bit of trouble with the alcohol. So I had to move back and run his moving company, which was mm. started by my grandfather back in the 40s. So it's this, you know, big New England moving business. I was the only one with the driver's license on the crew. I was the only one with the full set of teeth. So <laughs> I was, you know, driving the moving truck, you know, moving households all over New England with, you know, crickety steps and narrow hallways and big old pieces of furniture. But Alan, I wouldn't lie. It was a very difficult time. And I, you know, definitely struggled throughout, but I did have the time of my life doing it. We laughed every single day. Every day was a new adventure. Who were we moving? Where were they going? What's their house like? It was like, are you, are you, are you on the Zillow app, Alan? Do you ever yes. go on Zillow? Yes. I, I'm addicted to Zillow. I'm always on the Zillow. So every day was like living in the Zillow app. Who's selling? Where are they moving? I really just love the seeing people's homes. Yeah, so absolutely. Fun. 
So were you the, you were the head person, like you took over the business, if you will? Yes, I took over the business. I was booking the jobs. I was giving the estimates. I got the trucks. I did the storage warehouse. It was, you know, running this business that has been this beast for 75 years in New England. Uh, we don't have a website. We don't have social media. It's all like, oh, yeah, you moved my father, you know, 17 years ago. You guys are the best. And, you know, it's kind of like that's the deal. So it's it's fun. The best New England word of mouth. I love it. That's hysterical. Yeah. Um, so you Thanks. did mention that you were on The Gay Bachelor. I have to know, what was that like? And how how did that even come about? I mean, obviously living in LA, it's very much a, a, a city of television and entertainment. Yeah. But like, did you just want to go on it and got cast? Or how did that not come not about? The last thing I was looking for, Alan. in LA, it's like hard not to get cast for a reality show when you're in Los Angeles. I just feel like they're coming out of the woodworks. But I lived in West Hollywood next to a very nice gentleman named Ethan Peterson, and he runs the casting agency. Mm. So he casts all the queens on RuPaul's Drag Race, and he was working on this new show called Finding Prince Charming. Mm. And I would run past his house every morning and, you know, go on my little jogs. And he stopped me one day saying, Robbie, I think I have the perfect TV show for you. I said, oh, great. What is it? He goes, it's The Gay Bachelor. And my first thought, Alan, was, oh, no, there's no way I'm going to do The Gay Bachelor because I had just be met my boyfriend, Gavin. Mm. We've been together five years now. But I think I had met him two weeks before wow. Ethan stopped me to ask me about this show. And I said, you know, I'm dating this guy. It's going well. I really like him. I don't think I should go on the show. He goes, do not come on the show for love. Go for the experience. This is, you know, a historic moment. It will be the first all gay dating show hmm. and you're going to meet friends you'll have for the rest of your life. And it's a great experience. So, you know, I'm always down for a good time, Sagittarius. So it just it worked out perfectly for me. My lease was ending in West Hollywood and they put us up in this big mansion, you know, in Tarzana or wherever it was yeah. in the valley. And we had a great time. I was on the show a long time. Six weeks, Alan. Wow. That's a long time in the mansion. No cell phone. You can't leave the house. We were like locked in this house. It was nuts, man. We had a great time though. So like rumor has it that on those shows that they kind of booze you up and keep you very kind of adrift yeah. of mental stability, maybe. Is that the case that you kind of had to, you were just stuck in this house dealing with whatever the cameras and producers were telling you? That's what it was. Alan, we never saw, or I should say, I never saw the bottom of my glass. It would, the drinks were always poured. It was always full. And I mean... I normally do not drink. I work on television full, you know, for my job. I never drink. I never smoke before TV. But uh, this was like I was drunk the whole entire time. We had so much fun to the point where I was like slurring my words and they ha we had to reshoot the whole thing. And it was like a <laughs> mess. We had so much fun. That's hysterical. Do you still have friends from that show? Like, do you still stay in contact? I do. It was as if like we went to war or something, Alan. You know, we had <laughs> not war. Thing bonding experience you know it was like we all went through it together it was a bit of a what is it called when your kidnapper keeps you and you fall in love with your kidnapper what's that called like delusional <laughs> delusional like that thing like we were like really thought like we were gonna win and the, when Robert would come in the bachelor we were all like ah, Robert's here oh it's Robert you know it was almost like a, we called ourselves sister wives because we were all getting along but we all had the same person the same love interest so we were the sister wives and we laughed the whole time. It was a blast. That's amazing. I highly recommend any newcomers or people that have been in LA for a while, if you had the option or opportunity to go on a reality show, take it. Mm. That is my life advice. Take the show and just have a blast. Do you, that's amazing. Do you, what do you think like was kind of the outcome of that? Because obviously you're on a nationally syndicated show. Everyone kind of sees you. You are a very vivacious Sagittarius personality. So did that really garner a lot for you after the fact? It, it was. It was wonderful. I mean, for me, the the response from the viewers and fans was just also positive, which I was very very grateful for. And you know, it was a, I. I see myself in a lot of these fans that have reached out because they're young and, you know, kind of effeminate and just they aren't afraid to be themselves like I was on the show as well. So I connected with that that LGBT kind of personality and it, it was great. I, I absolutely loved it. So the fan base was great. And I mean, I remember the whole year afterwards, I couldn't go into the Abbey or the chapel without lines of people all wanting to take selfies. I was really in all my glory and I loved <laughs> everything. 
I was on the top of the pride float, you know, yes. A KY, we were the, we got a KY jelly commercial. They paid us $20,000 for the KY jelly commercial. It was the time in my life. I loved it. That's amazing. But then right after this whole thing is when you had to go back to the East coast, right? Is that, is that the line? Yeah. The timeline. And that's like, though, it's all about slap and tickle, right? (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's what it was. I was feeling myself and then boom, big slap. Yeah. But. It was all good, but you know, throughout it all, I'm sure we'll touch on this, but you know, my Buddhist faith was really the anchor throughout this whole entire experience that when in the bachelor house, there was a big Buddha out by the pool. Mm. I chanted every single morning, taught all the boys in the house how to chant, even the bachelor himself. And that did get some airtime on TV. Granted, it was like kind of a little online digital click here to see Robbie chanting with Robert, but Mm. still I'm happy I got the word out. And then moving back home, to run this moving business, I just found such gratitude in what I was doing. So thank God for this Buddhism. Yes, that's amazing. So I'm intrigued by, you know, you're so vivacious. And like you said, talking about like the LGBTQ uh, folks and really being true and authentic to yourself. Have you always kind of just been yourself since a young age and just kind of like no Fs to give or was it a process for you kind of coming out and becoming the true Robbie Lariviere that you are now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. For me, I don't know. I feel like I've always been a bit of a character and a bit of a like a fun, loving kid, even when I was younger. And, you know, there is that internal struggle. I remember answering the phone and deepening my voice on the phone because mm. everyone always thought I was my mother yes, when I answered ditto. the phone. So I like that. So I would like sometimes put on a deeper voice. I was on the football team. So I felt like I had to mask it up then as well. But you, you're still yourself at the end of the day. And for me, I was always just very flamboyant. And I remember, or just the other day, I went on, we were out boating here in New England. And I went on a boat with a girl I went to preschool through eighth grade with. The girl's name was Marina Royal. And I, her parents were there and everything like that. And they said, Robbie, you have not changed. You've been like this since preschool. Like, you know, you have not changed. So that was kind of reaffirming that I kind of always have been this funny little kid. That's amazing. I think that, yeah, being true and authentic, and I can definitely relate to the whole trying to mask it up or changing the voice because either it was someone calling for the pizza order or someone calling to just talk to your whomever at the house and they'd be like, yes, miss. Or I put in an order for the pizza and they'd be like, yes, ma'am, what did you want? And I'm like, oh, dear God, like, help me. It's still to this day and I just own it and I don't even care. I laugh about it. It's like an ongoing joke. Yeah, exactly. Things always get better. I know the listeners... I don't know if your listeners can see me, but I am a man. They may think you're interviewing a woman right now. Stop. That's hysterical. No, they can't see you, but that's okay. They're definitely hearing you. And we know that you are a man, very strong man. So speaking of strength, I'm curious kind of what do you see as kind of your greatest strength since you've kind of come out to LA, you've taken on the reality TV world, you've taken on the beauty world and stayed here for many years, which can't be said for everybody. So uh, what do you really see as your greatest strength that you've been able to kind of last? You know, I really think the greatest strength in life is to obviously be in the present, accept the situation for what it is, but know that it, the glass is really always half full. And that's kind of how I've always seen everything in life. For, some may say I'm wearing rose tinted glasses and mm-hmm. maybe I'm in a little bit of delusion, but life is all about perception and how you view the situation that even hell can be enjoyable. That's a quote from you know, Daisaku Ikeda right there. But even hell can be enjoyable, and I'm a big believer in that. And that comes from my parents, that they have been through hell and back uh, in their own personal struggles, but still throughout it, they still keep a smile on their face and an optimistic outlook. So that definitely comes from within. Yes, absolutely. So speaking of family, it sounds like you're very close to your family. Obviously, you know, you went back home, which not everyone does and took on the family business. And, um, you know, you do you find your family to be very close to you and a very tight knit fam? Yeah, we're very fortunate to have a tight knit family. You know, my it's an Irish Catholic family. My mom's one of six. Father's one of seven. Everyone grew up in that same town of Bradford. We own Bradford Movers. 
And it seemed like all the aunts and uncles on both sides have like, they're the same age. Then we all have cousins the same age. So growing up, I didn't have friends. I had cousins and it's still Mm -hmm. that way today. We were out to the wee hours of last night, uh, swinging from the rafters, all the cousins together. You know, we have a great time. And now our girl cousins are all pregnant with girls of their own all at the same time too. So it's just this generational yeah. Uh, family thing here in New England. So we do, we love life and have a great time. That's fantastic. I love that. I find, yeah, the closer you are to your family, I feel like you really create this sense of love and support and understanding. And yeah, I love the fact that you said, I didn't have friends. I have, you know, family. Yeah, I have cousins. That's, that yeah, is our. That was, that was it. it. We were always together. It's fun. But I think that also stems from our parents constantly being with their siblings as well. It's just, yeah. It's how it was in this town. So we love it. That's fantastic. So have you found that there's kind of a point in your career that you feel, felt like you really like made it and were really kind of like, I've been fighting so hard for this thing, you know, for my entire however long. And then, you know, it kind of came true. And what, if so, kind of what was that for you? Yes. Great. Oh, you asked the best questions, Alan. That is good stuff. But, you know, I think most recently uh, doing what I'm doing now as the international brand ambassador for Nick Chavez has been such a dream of mine come true. And there's been many dreams come true over the course of, you know, however long it's been, 14 years doing hair. And this is a good one, though. I really love the the wave I'm on right now. And I'm really enjoying it. To I think the moment was, and it brought tears to my eyes when I was flying first class down to Australia or, you know, something like that. He said, wow, Robbie, like you're actually doing this right now. It was very, very surreal Hmm. and, but it's felt so right. and so present and in the moment too. So I think that first trip to Australia really was like, oh my goodness, this is happening right now. So that felt good. Yeah. Living, living in the moment and feeling it and kind of seeing your own life from the outside perspective. You're like, wait a minute, like this is reality. This is what I'm doing. This is incredible. And it's hard to do that in Los Angeles because it seems like every day is a new thing, a new, you're, it's just always going. It's it's nonstop. You don't have time to really sit back and realize, oh, wow, I'm doing it. I'm living my dreams. I'm making this happen right now. Uh, for me, that happens on a plane. I, I like to think, maybe because I'm closer to the sky or whatever it is, but I always get very uh, philosophical on the airplanes. That's, I love that. That's great. Yeah. Well, I feel like you have the time to get philosophical and really be in your thoughts or in your, your, yeah, your head, if you will, um, for you to be able to, yeah, kind of figure everything out when you're in this bubble on the way to wherever you are going. So that makes sense. And then on the other end, it can be torture on planes as well. I've had plane rides where I'm not flying high and I'm sitting in the middle row in the back and my, you know, it's not the same thought process either. It's like, oh God, get off this plane. Yeah. But you know, it is. 100%. I know I was flying uh, two weeks ago to like the Midwest and yes. it was uh, one of those flights where it's like three big people, including myself on an aisle and I'm on the end and I'm kind of like, it's that shuffle that you have to do where you're like lean forward. So the other person's back and then opposite the entire flight for three hours oh. and you're just like, kill me now. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Torture. No, thanks. Yeah, definitely different mindset for sure. That's where I think the Buddhism has to really kick in and you have to be like, I I got this. This is this is not hell. And like you said, even in hell, it can be the most beautiful and awakened place. So, yeah, absolutely. So my next question is, um, you know, what really brings you the most happiness now versus maybe when you first started out, came to L.A. and were kind of figuring out your your way through the uh, industry? Yeah, interesting. I think. I don't know if this really answers the question, but my goals have kind of changed so much after being in Los Angeles. You know, the goal was to have the the mansion in Bel Air with the, you know, wrought iron gates out front and the house in Malibu and everything like that. And now I'm happy in my little carriage house where I live now, you know, so just my expectations or my goals are just life. I realize that you do not need all this glitz and glam to be happy, that you can really create happiness wherever you are. So I think for me, what makes me happiest, that was the question, right? Well, mm-hmm. or how, how has my happiness changed? Right. That I'm really appreciating what I can afford, what's real and what's mine, as opposed to seeking outside myself and wanting something else or everything like that. So just enjoying what you have. 
has brought me the most happiness as opposed to wanting, wanting more and constantly, you know, as Sagittarians, we're half man, half horse Mm. with a bow and arrow pointed high at the sky, galloping forward on a horse. So really pointing at something that would be not necessarily logical to attain when pointing the arrow. However, in our minds, it's all very attainable. So for now, I've stopped pointing the arrow and I'm just enjoying the ride. I like that. You seem very into astrology, kind of what got you into the astrological signs. Yeah, a- astrology is something I've been studying probably since I was 16 years old. Wow, okay. And uh, like hardcore. And I, for me, I'm not a pushover when it comes to these things. I, I kind of had to test it out and make sure it was tried and true. But after reading countless astrological reports and everything like that on different people, I found it so correct, so spot on that how could I not take it as what it is? So I really enjoy astrology because I use it as a guide. For instance, Mercury's in retrograde right now, so we don't really want to buy a car or any electronics during this period. So I, I go by that guideline as well. Although lately I've been saying I'm Buddhist and I have the power to even excel and go above and beyond the limits Mercury retrograde is putting on us. So stay tuned. We'll see how that goes. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. My mom's really into astrology as well. She's actually a holistic doctor. um, And so she's all about, you know, the alignment of everything. But yeah, I do agree with you that having this Buddhist practice, right, and everything starts with you and kind of you're able to create, you know, your situation and your future and your environment doesn't necessarily have to be guided by the the planetary alignment right you can still make you know positive we have power. Yeah, absolutely totally. what was your mom's sign what's she she is a leo she's in july leo. great yes. that's awesome that's great yeah i always get the shade because every every time i tell someone that i'm a june gemini they're like oh okay that the, is absurd. No, but it's a thing. As I don't know if it's just here in Los Angeles or what, but everyone's kind of like, oh, I could never date a Gemini, especially a June one. Why is that? Why did Geminis have such a bad rap? Because that happens. If you say that, like, that's the response. Ooh, when people say they're a Gemini. I love my Geminis. I love gems. My sister, little sister is pregnant right now. She's mm. due June 1st. So oh, tomorrow. Gonna tomorrow. We're going to have a little Gemini girl in the family. I'm going to have a little Gemini niece. That's so amazing. I love my gems. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that we get the bad rap from the sense that we are the twins, right? So I feel like it's very much this duality of like almost yin and yang, if you will. And I definitely have two sides. Like, don't fuck with me. <laughs> yeah. But what also. Two sides? What are your two sides? Like. I mean, I tend to be very kind of overly caring and very happy and vivacious, but I also, and the flip side of that can be very quiet and calm and like, you know, to myself and very serious. And I think that so many people ultimately see the very open and kind of charismatic and fun and energetic side. So when I'm not like that, people usually freak out or they think something's wrong, you know, and I'm like, no, I'm just being calm and like, don't need to be like the life of the party. Hello. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's nice. That's a good Gemini thing. I've seen Geminis where they their lives are very polar opposites. You know, they're kindergarten teachers during the day and at night they're like doing drugs and like hanging from the ceiling and like going crazy. Like it, it's <laughs> very much that yin and yang for yeah. sure. Yeah. I don't think I'm that severe. For Fortunately, <laughs> I don't think I'd be here in LA or maybe even alive if that was the case. But yeah. Exactly. Definitely have the the duality for sure. So obviously, like you you did mention the fact that, you know, you kind of are freelance in the sense of, you know, you do like gig to gig. So what is kind of your work ethic like? And, you know, you obviously flew across the, the nation multiple times this year and even last year during the pandemic and everything. So, you know, it's not easy to kind of keep going in this creative field. So, you know, what does it really take for you to do your work? You know, I am a workhorse. I love working. Uh, But that being said, this kind of career and where I am at my work right now is feast or famine Hmm. in the sense that I'm not working nine to five Monday through Friday. I work a few times a month. But during those few times a month I work, it's 12 hour days getting up at 430 in the morning, being live on TV. Like when I hit it, I hit it hard. And we work very hard doing what we do because you know, I'm all over the world selling Nick Chavez. So 6.30 p.m. in Russia is 3.30 in the morning here in Massachusetts. So you just kind of have to get up and deal with it. And 
in addition to being the spokesperson, I'm the hairdresser as well. Right. So I have to do everyone's hair. And hair on TV has to be perfect, mm -hmm. especially if you're manipulating it and doing things that it has to be set in a certain way that it will always look good. So that takes intense mental concentration as well. I'm tired after doing the hair, but then you have to get on and sing and dance for a half an hour to an hour, sometimes two hours live with no commercial breaks. That Wow. When I work, we work hard, but I love doing what I do and I, I wouldn't change it. That's incredible. So what's like one thing that you've really learned about yourself while doing all of this work and being this international, you know, spokesperson for Nick Chavez and um, also doing all the hair and working kind of has it brought out something that you maybe didn't recognize prior to doing what you do? Yeah, I think like anything, I mean, practice makes perfect. So when I started doing this gig, I was very nervous, you know, would review the notes, how to get every single ingredient of every product and everything like that, really kind of over preparing myself for it. But now I'm very grateful that I'm at the point where I don't even look at the paper. It's just, you know, I go on and I know what I'm doing and I'm able to clock in, be present and just be here for it. So that's been a really nice learning curve for me not to get so nervous. But in the beginning, how could I not be nervous, you know, because I didn't have that experience under my belt. But right. now that I've done this so much that I'm just at a very comfortable place and an enjoyable place to love what you're doing and to be loving every second of it is the best. So I'm very grateful to be there. That's amazing. So how did you actually become like the spokesperson for Nick Chavez? Well, I was working at a hair salon in Beverly Hills mm -hmm. inside the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, which is the Pretty Woman Hotel. Yes. And yes, the best. And I remember I was in Provincetown before getting that job, chanting away, hosting Buddhist meetings at my little cottage in P-Town every morning. And I chanted so hard to work at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. And then that dream came to, into fruition. Wow. So a, another thing that kind of came into fruition over the course of my career through chanting. And when working at the Beverly Wilshire, I then decided QVC was the way to go. The owner of that salon had a line at, on QVC, wasn't doing so well, did okay, but it wasn't doing that great. But mm -hmm. I figured, oh, maybe that will be my in. I'll, I'll sell her product line on QVC. But it turned out uh, probably five years after working at that salon, one of the regular clients there, I won't say her name, <laughs> but she is a bit of a B-I-T-C-H, like in the best way possible. She's like a Miranda Priestly, like, you mm. know, boss ass bitch, don't fuck with her. Like, she's amazing. So am I allowed to swear? Yeah, of course. Let's do it. Oh, uh, you're the best down. So it, she's just a woman you didn't want to upset or anything like that. I was too afraid to do her hair. I didn't even do her hair. Mm. But she would always hear me jabbing away with all the other clients in the salon. And she's like, this kid can freaking talk anyone's ear off that he might be a good spokesperson for her husband's brand who owns part of Nick Chavez. Oh, wow. So that's how that, it was in the right time at the right place. Absolutely. So that's how that all worked out. So they put me up for the role, flew me down to Australia, and we sold out of everything. So that's when I knew it worked out. That's incredible. So is Nick Chavez really kind of, it's more of an international brand than it is, say, like here in the States, like on a QVC or international. I mean, he's, his brand's been around for over 30 years. I'm 31. So I think it's been around 32 years. So as long as I've been alive, this guy has been selling his shampoos, conditioners, hairsprays on QVC. Wow. He's a, he's, if you watch QVC, you know, Nick Chavez and ladies love him. They absolutely love him. And, uh, last year, unfortunately, Nick did get sick. He mm -hmm. found out he had stage two pancreatic cancer, oh, wow. which is not good. Mm -hmm. And that's when my workload really got amped up because Nick was obviously going through treatment. We had a pandemic. So I just filmed all year long for him. I'm so happy to report he beat his cancer, which is unheard of and so amazing. So he's coming back on the airwaves here in America, but I'll continue to be the international brand ambassador. So it's a great deal. We're in Russia, Germany, Canada, Australia, and soon to be Japan. So yes. That one, that's a big goal of mine. I yes. can't wait to get there. Yes, konnichiwa. I love it. You better just, yes. yeah, get your Japanese up and running. That's fantastic. <laughs> So um, through all of this that you've just shared, kind of who has been your biggest supporter or fan uh, that's really helped you to keep going through, you know, the ups and downs of your career and just life struggles? 
I would say my boyfriend, Gavin, has been a huge support for me. I mean, Gavin is just absolutely amazing. He's younger than I am. There's a six-year age difference between the two of us. Mm -hmm. But he is just so grounded and mature in his thinking. And it's something that is innate within him. He just kind of has this sense of balance in what's right and what's wrong and how to approach certain situations that I'd fear I'd get too caught up in my head or too worried about you know, where's the next gig or what's happening or just if there were troubles getting flustered. But Gavin has really been that rock to just kind of keep things balanced and say, you know, don't worry, babe, it's all happening the way it should. So I'm very grateful for Gavin. That's fantastic. And you guys- Five years, Alan, that's a long time. Yes, especially in gay years. Five years is like a decade or longer. So he's also an artist, correct? Gavin's an artist, yes. He went to FIT Mm. uh, in Manhattan. And that's we met when he was at school in New York. I was working in New York at a gig. So we were long distance for two and a half years between LA and New York. And then he moved to LA two years ago with me. So we've had fun. But yeah, he's an amazing artist. That's kind of his, you know, his hobby, what he loves doing. But he does have a, a normal job Monday through Friday. Got it. I love it. The artists come together. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, the longer the relationship is you kind of, yeah, you get to know each other and the support definitely kind of grows, um, or at least you hope it does. (laughs) And I think the trust grows as well. I think trust Mm -hmm. factor is a big deal, especially me being on the go, traveling all the time and everything like that, that we can still, you know, love, trust and support each other even when we aren't together. So that's nice. And the fact that, you know, there's kind of the foundation of our relationship, long distance for two and a half years, me going on an all gay dating show in the middle of us dating, like, you know, it'd be hard if you were a jealous or suspicious type of person to go through that. But, you know, throughout it all, Gavin has just supported me and trust me. So I'm very grateful. So, you know, obviously last year you kind of mentioned with COVID-19 and it affected so many people and like all types of ways, financially or otherwise, Um, you know, so what was it for you that really kept you going through it? Obviously you said you became like the face and brand ambassador really for Nick Chavez and almost maybe even more work was like on your plate than before, but yeah. Oh, well, I mean, going through it for me, work was huge and traveling and everything like that was huge. And I know not everyone obviously had that opportunity. So I was very grateful, but my sympathies obviously go out to people that were by themselves in their house. You know, I, I'm not good at being alone. I, I'm really not. I enjoy having Gavin. I enjoy just having people around and stimulation. So to be locked in your house for all these years with just you and the TV, it's like, oh, it, it's, I can see how people really have gone crazy. However, thank God again for our Buddhism because these Zoom meetings have been so helpful for so many people Mm. coming on and being able to discuss what's happening and just have a face-to-face contact with someone, albeit through a little square screen. But, you know, that connection has really, really been helpful and having this Buddhism, reaching out to people, making sure they're doing well and having people reach out to you, that sense of love and community has been so helpful throughout this whole pandemic. And I've seen people that don't necessarily practice our Buddhism that are wanting to know more because they need something. People need this spiritual outlet or connection. So I loved what we're doing here at the Creative Lotus podcast, Alan. This is amazing. This has been really fun. Listening to these podcasts on my long drives and everything like that has just been such a joy. So to be a part of this is really surreal and exciting. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. So you obviously have spoken about your Buddhist practice. So I'm really intrigued. Like, how did you get introduced to it? And um, obviously you've been practicing for quite some time, but I'm just curious kind of, you know, what's your, what's your story on that? Well, you know, I was introduced to this Buddhism in a kind of a roundabout way. I touched on Buddhism thought and literature when I was living in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I was meeting, I wanted a book to read. So I went to the foreign language section of this bookstore, which is the only English section there was, which I found (laughs) kind of funny. And it said an introduction to Tibetan Buddhism. And I was like, oh, well, this is interesting. I might as well give it a read. And I really connected with Buddhist thought and philosophy. I I loved it. And I did attend a Buddhist meeting down there. It wasn't Nietzsche and Daishonin Buddhism. It was Mm -hmm a different sect and they had a guru come and I could feel Mm. his presence. And I was like, this is totally me. I'm absolutely loving it. We did a little chant. I can't remember what we chanted, Mm -hmm. but then moving to LA, I moved to Santa Monica after completing Vidal Sassoon. Mm -hmm. 
and we lived on 6th in Wilshire in Santa Monica. And you know all too well, Alan, 6th and Wilshire is also where the SGI headquarters is located. Right. So we were literally neighbors with this Buddhist organization. And I was out walking my dog at the time, and I was accosted by a beautiful Buddhist woman, this woman named Marie, who asked if you know I chanted and I knew about Buddhism. I said, yes, I do, actually. I used to chant in Brazil. Granted, it wasn't Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, but she invited us into the center to chant, and I just really, I fell in love with it. So I continued going to Buddhist meetings, and um, here we are, I think 12 years later. So I've loved it. It changed my whole entire life, and I've been able to introduce countless young men and women to this Buddhism as well, and I've seen how it changed their lives as well. Then they introduced people. So, uh, you know, we say this practice is about world peace, Kozen Rufu, Mm -hmm. and uh, I feel like I'm doing my little part as far as creating ripples of happiness and world peace by introducing one person after the next to this practice. Wow, that was so well said. I love the fact that you said it got accosted by a woman. And it is kind of true. I mean, it is definitely uh, people wanting to help other people and especially young people to become happy. And like you said, creating those ripple effects through dialogue and, you know, each person's happiness like is the wave that kind of is created from that. So yeah, that's amazing. And now's the time, Alan, people really need this Buddhism because, you know, I heard, you know, I have friends that I thought were so strong that are just, you know, crying that they're, they're at a breaking point right now. And I can't believe it. I was like, wow, like I didn't really know the struggle was that real. Mm -hmm. I I hope I had, but maybe they're just so good at hiding it, but people are struggling right now and they need this. They need this Buddhism bad. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting, too, because I think you tap into something that especially like in American society, you know, we were so hit by COVID and the amount of death that happened. And I feel like the mental health side of things we don't really talk about. You know, I think as society, we kind of just say, keep it in right and deal with it yourself. But then, you know, you don't see it. And even in the people that are the closest to you, you kind of, you know, I think the the good side or the good side of the coin maybe of COVID is that people really had to face those things, but also vocalize them and share them. That's, that's what it is. You know, and not going to work. I think working from home has really affected people too, because you know, they don't have their colleagues to bounce off of or anything like that. It's, it's hard being in a room. There's zoom fatigue is a real thing. Mm-hmm. And I, people are just suffering. Of course, all the deaths, COVID it's just been a nightmare. But we did, I don't know, how's it going in California right now? We did open back up in Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. no masks. Mm. So it was so nice to be able to walk down the street without a mask on, go into the restaurant without a mask. I'm in heaven. Yeah. So June 15th is the reopening of California. And I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, (laughs) California is now actually having a a lottery. So if you've gotten the vaccine, you're entered into this lottery. They're giving out uh, like $13.8 million dollars. And but I'm this down. Where, where do <laughs> no, if I'm you, feeling, I'm if, feeling lucky. If you got, if you have been vaccinated here in California, you're already entered to win. But there's mm-hmm. ten people that are going to be like pulled out of this lottery who have gotten vaccinated, and you can win one point eight or like one point five million dollars times ten people. And now I think for the next like ten days, they're giving away fifty dollar gift cards if you get vaccinated. So Gavin Newsom is really putting money, and there's other states that are doing the same, really pushing to get vaccinations so we can hit this herd immunity and people really stay safe, right? So you can take off the mask, you can go back to quote unquote normal and be able to kind of build this this economy but also just like life again i feel like people are so isolated and you know kind of yeah. scared to kind of get out again and so it'd be great to to get back yes time to get out people get out get out get out smell the roses it's a beautiful day um i hope i win the lottery <laughs> would that be amazing that would be amazing what would you do with the money Oh, I don't even know what I would do. What would I do? I would give back to our organization out of sincere appreciation a little bit. <laughs> and and I'd, I don't know, buy a house or something like that. A million dollars? I'd buy a house. Yeah. No, absolutely. And like a, a little car to drive around in, like a fun little car. I love it. 
Yeah. It's yeah. so funny because I feel like LA is like, I was talking with friends about this last night. It's like the delusional space of money in the sense that yeah. unless you really have like an ass load of money, it is so yeah. hard to live in this city at that yeah. level. Right. You say like, Oh, I won $1.5 million. And you're like, girl, that doesn't even buy you a condo in this city. That's like in a nice neighborhood and a nice place. Yeah. It's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. I don't think I'd buy in LA. I'd, I'd buy back here in Massachusetts. However, Alan, you and I, we are not chums and the real estate market is so inflated right now yeah. that we'd be fools to throw money down at, for an overpriced house. So I might let that million dollars chill in my bank account mm -hmm. and then buy when prices go down. Yeah, absolutely. Is How is the real estate market where you're at now in Massachusetts? Hot, hot, hot. Yeah. It's everyone. It's selling left and right, way over asking price. You know, I did put a bid in on a house down the Cape, my dream house, I thought, mm. but it was just way too complicated. And I think they paid way over asking. And, you know, I don't have money up the ass by any means. So they didn't, it didn't happen for me, but rejection is the Lord's protection. Everything happens for a reason. I love so it. I have now. Yes. No, I think that it's funny because it's like. Yeah, it's the market is ridiculous. And because people are unsure whether or not they're going to even go back to work and they're just going to be living out of their house, people are just like buying up this investment property. And it's such a seller's market here in California or LA that, yeah, yeah. they can ask whatever and they know they're going to get more than what they are even asking for because it becomes a bidding war. So, yeah, yeah it'd be, it's kind of nuts to think of purchasing now because you probably will be wasting your your dollar if you if you kind of go that route. So, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Here, there's a lot of pandemic puppies and COVID captains. I think that's definitely one thing that happened, right? We People got a lot of dogs, and yeah. now they're going back to I don't think they're going to be able to keep the dogs. <laughs> and people bought a lot of boats around here, and they don't know how to use the boats. It's a nightmare. So it's like crazy ties, man. That's Not good. nuts. Oh, my gosh. The pounds are going to be full, and the boats are going to be capped. Like People are just going to yeah. – they're like, back to reality. Oh, whoops. We did these things while we were in COVID. Exactly. That's hysterical. So kind of looking to the future, what are kind of some goals that you may have for yourself for like, let's say the next year, three years, five years from now? Um, kind of what is the life of Robbie LaRiviere? Well, I, I only see goodness in my future. I see a lot of love and light going on. I, I can smell, I can hear wedding bells. I'm not mm. engaged, but I can definitely see a, a marriage happening in the next three years or so. Hint, hint, wink, I wink. I can hear barking as well. I can see a little dog coming into the picture. So, you know, that kind of personal stuff happening and continuing to enjoy this journey with the Nick Chavez team. They've been wonderful. It's an amazing product that works. Um, I wouldn't be surprised or opposed to doing some sort of collaboration with Nick, almost like a Robbie X Nick Chavez brand, clean beauty, uh, m maybe Nantucket sourced, something along those lines. So the shoe really hasn't quite fallen for that. You know, I haven't gone to labs or started concocting anything, but mm -hmm. I can see that happening in five years. And I think that would be wonderful. Put my little stamp on something instead of selling everyone else's stuff. So it'd be nice to have my own little thing. But until then, I have a wonderful hair care brand that I'm working with right now. And I'm very happy. That's amazing. Do you see yourself, and we were just talking about property, but do you see yourself buying a house and kind of settling down? I, you did say dog and marriage and everything. So is that encompassed? Well, yes. A house was very much first um, on the goal list, but now it's, it's not as much of a priority anymore. I don't know what happened. It's like a flick switch and it's, I'm just not sweating over buying a house anymore. I had so much pressure on myself last year to buy a home by this time last year and it didn't happen however gavin and i did move into my dream house in los angeles yay great we're renting but it feels like a home and we love it so it's nice to save money and not a uh, sweat over a mortgage payment or anything like that so uh really just enjoying the present but definitely buying a house would love to buy a house give it three years i'd say fantastic and we'll get going yeah how old am i now alan i'm 31 now so i think Come 34 by the time that rolls around. Uh, I hope we're still doing this podcast and we can check back in. Yes. Would that be fun? 
Absolutely. I love that. Definitely keep on going with it. So, you know, the name of this podcast, as you said, is the Creative Lotus Podcast. And it was really born out of the pandemic and really seeing how, you know, all these creative people in the industries that they're in have really thrived some way through the struggle. I kind of... um associated it with that of like the lotus flower, right? And in Buddhism, we talk about cause and effect and how the simultaneity of the blossom, but also the seeding in the mud. And through that mud, you know, they kind of, you create this beautiful, you know, lotus flower. And so I always ask each guest kind of through all of your struggles and everything that you've done as, you know, a creative, what has really been your like blossom of lotus in your own life? If you can describe that. That's so beautiful, Alan. I love that. And don't they say like the muddier the water, the brighter the lotus flower? Yes. Right? That's amazing. You know, I would say helping my father out that my father is an amazing man, so gregarious and just an absolute life at the party. Anyone that meets him loves him. But his dark times have really not necessarily become my own, but I've really been able to get down and dirty, help him out, help the family out. And become a better person from it really going into that struggle you know he's away right now he's you know doing what he needs to do Mm -hmm. but I was over at his place all day packing him up doing putting things in boxes everything like that so you know it's not all glam and glitz but really those times where we get to buckle down and help out the family and really just do what we have to do kind of like um but silently you know this is all personal stuff, personal dilemmas that we're kind of working through as a family, but ultimately, you know, you thrive and you do feel good. Yeah. You feel really accomplished after helping those in need out. So for ne- right now, that's my father and I'm happy to help him because he's helped me my whole entire life. So it's weird when the children become parents, that's a, that's a strange thing. And that's what we're all, we all have to go through that. So I'm starting to uh, realize that struggle now and the joy in it as well, that it's, you know, it, it is joyful despite it all. Yeah. The flipping of roles is definitely something that we have to get used to as adults and, you know, yeah. kind of going into your thirties. Some people have it sooner than others, obviously, but yeah, taking that responsibility on and really digging or kind of leaning into it instead of just running away from it. And I think yeah. that, yeah, when our younger age, we might have just run away from it. And oh, you know, yeah. I like, in LA, all my twenties, I lived in LA. So now I'm in my 30s and I'm back and I'm here to help people. What, yeah. do, I, what do you need? <laughs> I'm just curious if you were to talk to your future self, kind of like you said, so let's do a, another episode in a few years, but like, let's say 15 years from now, where, what would you really say to your future self, almost like a time capsule um, to the Robbie of, you know, into his, oh my gosh, dare we say it, your 40s. Um, 15 years, I'll be 46 and... I would say, you know, I hope it all worked out for you, Robbie. <laughs> like, I, I hope you're doing well. Um, <laughs> I'm dying. <laughs> honey, you know, I hope you have the houses and the cars and the whole thing and that you're able to help out your family and help people and continue to make the world a happy place. Hmm. That I'd say keep doing what you're doing, but on a grander scale with more stability. And may you have all your ducks in a row. Hmm. That's well said. Yes. Do you, I didn't ask this before, but do you want kids? Like, is that something you see in the future or is it like doggy pet f- children? Yeah. I mean, I've always wanted kids, Alan, but I've always wanted to live in Bel Air and live in Malibu too. So like, I wonder like, as those goals evolve, like, are the children going to like not be in my forefront anymore? But I think so. I, I want kids. I know Gavin wants kids. We talk okay. about it often. We are getting a dog. We're going to house sit next week for, or dog sit rather mm-hmm. at our house. So we can kind of test run, so mm-hmm. to speak. But it's like walking the dog in the morning, taking it out at night, feeding the dog. So I think if that works out, we'll get a puppy of our own. And then, you know, kids in the future, I'd say probably that 10 year, 15 year mark from now would be children. Cause we, as gay men you can kind of have children when we want ish, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not in a rush biologically to have a child in my thirties. Right. But I feel like come my forties when I'm very financially stable and comfortable and have my rhythm, I think a child would be a wonderful thing. Twins even. I love the idea of two twin boys. Wow. That's that's that's, stur- that's a sturdy family. I like that. Is um yeah. what kind of dog would you get? I I'm looking at like miniature labradoodles or miniature golden doodles. 
just because they're very well behaved. I enjoy their temperament. They don't shed. Um, and the dog where dog sitting is a Labradoodle. So my, mm. it's my ex's dog who is very well behaved. I mean, the, the, those dogs, you could hang them upside by one leg and they wouldn't, they would just look at you like, Hey, you know, they, they aren't like wild. Right. So I'd like them. Yeah. I just like the name doodle and then anyone's name, you're like Labradoodle. Yeah. Labradoodle. <laughs> yeah, Labradoodle. We looked at this dog. It was like a, a Chihuahua Pomeranian doodle, like something or other. <laughs> it was, it, a lot was going on. I think a doctor too. Oh, so we'll see, we'll, we'll we'll know it when we see it. And it's yeah. hard. It was very difficult last year to find dogs with the pandemic, but I find mm. the cute ones are starting to come out of the woodwork again. So that's nice. There were some scary looking dogs available during the pandemic. Well, apparently there's going to be a lot more available in Massachusetts because everyone can't handle the dogs, and I'm sure they're going to go back to the shelter. So yes, definitely find your pup and and take them with you. That's yes. too funny. We're going on vacation in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So I think when we get back on vacation, we'll then start seriously looking at dogs because you don't want to get a dog and go on vacation. That would be irresponsible. So I'll wait till we're back in town for good. That's awesome. Um, well, that's pretty much it for me. So I would love to kind of obviously thank you so much, but also I want okay. to give all the listeners kind of where can they follow you and find you and see all the fabulousness that you're doing. I would send them to Instagram. Come follow me on Instagram. We always have a great time. Um, I post fun stories of where I am and what I'm doing and when I'm on TV. So they can follow me at Robbie LaRiviere. Amazing. Happy to spell it out if they need it. Let's do it. R-O-B-B-Y-L-A-R-I-V-I-E-R-E. -E. That's French for the river. Oh, okay then. Le oui, the French river. I like it. La Riviere. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I love all the stories and everything that you're doing on on the IG. So definitely give a follow. If people want to see you on TV and everything, is it something that they can watch uh, locally? I know that you do a lot of international, like you said. It's a lot of international TV, but there is talk of me going on. Um, I mean, I might be on QVC tomorrow at 7 a.m. You never know. So yes. definitely go ahead, follow along, and I'll let you know where you can watch. Yay. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Robbie. I really appreciate it. This was so fun. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing everything that's to come in the next uh, weeks, months and years from now from you. Alan, you are the best. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Every second of this time flies huh that flew by for me this is a lot of fun alan and it's always great to see you and listen to you likewise thank you so much appreciate it i'll talk to you soon all right bye wasn't that such an amazing episode with Robbie LaRiviere? Once again, I want to thank Robbie for giving me the time and having such a great interview and talking about all the things. This week's Buddhist quote of the day is, Buddhism stresses the importance of the present and the future. There is little point in dwelling on the past. Far more constructive is looking to the future and moving forward. What is vital is that we achieve a bright and glorious future through our efforts and perseverance today by Daisaku Ikeda. Hey, Creative Lotus fam. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you're listening on Anchor.fm, you're actually able to leave me a voice memo in the messages section, and I'd love to hear what you have to say. Please leave a message and I can add it to an upcoming episode and getting your point of view on the Creative Lotus pod. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Creative Lotus Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Zaki. Please go ahead and subscribe, rate us, and write a review. And follow me at Alan Zaki on social media. I look forward to having more amazing creative dialogues on the next episode.